please bow your heads with me in prayer. Father, I praise you that you have poured out all heaven in Jesus. You also know that I feel incompetent to talk about such a grand gift that I only dimly understand. But I ask that your spirit would move our hearts, touch at our emotions, that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. As a child, I was petrified by end-time events. Now, I had parents that appreciated and read books that are euphemistically referred to as the spirit of prophecy. In fact, before bedtime, my father would come in and read to me and my sisters in the room across and down the hall. I had two younger sisters, and we shared the bedroom, which tells you we were all pretty young. And my, to his credit, to my parents' credit, um, they read really fun books to us. Uncle Arthur's Bible stories, Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories, My Bible Friends. But I don't know what possessed my dad to decide to read the great controversy to children before bedtime. Now, mind you, the book, The Great Controversy, is an excellent book. I, I'm actually reading it through right now, and it tells the story of God's people from the time of Jerusalem's fall to the end of time. And it has a large portion of it focusing on the persecution that God's people have faced and will face as things get worse. I was terrified. I still remember it. In fact, in the middle of the night, it was all dark. I would sit bolt upright in bed, shaking in the darkness. And I still, you know how it is when you just had a bad nightmare. And you're still expecting, I'm still waiting for the evil men to come and capture me, take me, torture me, and even kill me. By the way, I'm not alone. My wife and I compared notes, and guess what? Yes. She, too, was read the great controversy before bedtime, and she, too, had nightmares. I don't know what it is. It's a great book, but uh, not before bedtime and for children. And the reason I bring this up is because many Seventh-day Adventists, and indeed many Christians I know because I've talked to them, are frightened by end-time events terrified by them. Some won't even look at the book of Revelation because of it. And if you've ever been frightened by end time events, I want you to come with me to, to the book of Zechariah, chapter, chapter 12, 13, and 14. We're going to start with Zechariah 12 because these three chapters in the book of Zechariah, these three chapters are taken out of a book written about 500 years before Christ that was meant to encourage a bunch of ragtag exiles who were trying to build a broken down temple. Zechariah, especially the latter chapters, and especially chapter 12, 13, and 14, predicted that sometime future from Zechariah's time, that Jerusalem would be surrounded by its enemies 
It would be even captured. God's people would be persecuted, some tortured, some killed, some taken captive. But God would fight for his people and rescue and vindicate them. This prediction, however, never was fulfilled. Never was fulfilled. And you see, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there are a number of Old Testament predictions never that have never been fulfilled. And in that case, the New Testament is clear. That which applied to local, literal Israel in the time of the monarchies and captivity now is applied to God's end-time Israel just before the close of time. Are you following me? That which applied to local, literal Israel is now applied to worldwide, universal, spiritual Israel. And it's obvious this is the case because compare, Revel compare Zechariah 14 with Revelation 20 and you will realize that all Revelation does is it reinterprets Old Testament prophecies in the light of the cross. It takes unfulfilled Old Testament prophecies, reinterprets them in the light of the cross, and says this is how God is going to act on behalf of his people. Now, it's dangerous to make an assertion like that, but I think that we'll have to leave it at that for now. Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. Those three chapters are a chiasm. Do you know what a chiasm is? Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever, ever written a term paper? You know that a term paper has a certain structure to it, right? There's an introduction. There's a thesis statement. There's point A, point B, point C, point D. But where do you go to, if you want to just simply find the complete summary of that term paper? Where would you go? You would go where? You would go to the conclusion. Yes, you would. Not in Hebrew thought. You don't jump to the end in Hebrew thought especially if it's written in the form of a chiasm. A chiasm is like hiking up a mountain and then down the other side. You start with the introduction on one side of the mountain, you climb to the top, and then you go all the way down to the other side and you end with your conclusion, right? But on the way up the side of the mountain, you get to your first point. And then... On the way down, you're going to get to that same point again. It's repeating. For instance, how many of you have ever climbed up mountains? Let me see your hands. At least I have some company here. You know that there's a time when you leave the oak trees behind and you get into the pine trees, right? Yes or no? Okay. And, there, and guess what? On the way down on the other side, there's going to be a time when you leave the pine trees and get back into the oak trees. Yes or no? Okay, definitely. Is it going to be the same pine trees? No. But there's, there's a similarity between the two strata, right? And when you go up higher, there's a similarity. And when you get up higher, you will leave the pine trees and you will get in the, into the tundra. And guess what? On the other side of the mountain, you will do the same thing. You will leave the, leave the tundra and go back into the pine trees. It's going to be similar. There's going to be a correspondence between the two levels, right? That's exactly how a chiasm is organized. So when you read through Zechariah 14, you will see a chiasm. And do you know where the main point is? It's not at the end. It's not at the beginning. The main point is smack dab in the middle. Kind of weird to our thinking, amen? But that's how they did it. And if you understand that, you will understand what Zechariah is saying. Now, let me give you a quick introduction to Zechariah, chapters 12, 13, and 14. It is a prophecy 
exclusively about Israel. And of course, you and I are end time Israel. Chapter 12, verses 1, 2, 1, 2, and 3 tells us that is that Jerusalem will be surrounded. Guess what? On the other end, chapter 14, 1 and 2, Jerusalem is surrounded. All nations gathered against Israel. Chapter 12, verse 2, and also chapter 14, verse 2, on either side. Guess what? It will be difficult times. The next verses in chapter 12, and indeed the next verses in chapter 14, God steps up. He fights for his people. He delivers his people. And then finally, there comes the main point. And I'm not going to tell you what the main point is. Because you see, I want you to look at it for yourself. The apex of the chiasm, the summit of the chiasm, in the middle of three chapters talking about persecution and problems of God's people at the end, is not about persecution. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9. And it will come to pass in that day, and I'm only including this so you can see the flow here. It will come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against where? Jerusalem. And then verse 10, there's a complete segue into a brand new thought. This is the central apex of the, of the chiasm here. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications. God's going to do something. He's going to do something called pouring out. And what is he going to pour out? Grace. And what else? The spirit of what? Supplications. And who's he going to pour it out on? The house of David, thank you, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they're all Israelites, yes or no? They're all Israelites. And the Bible is exceedingly clear that unfulfilled prophecies will be fulfilled. Isaiah 55, my word will not return unto me void. Matthew 21, verse 43, Jesus said, The kingdom of God is going to be taken from you, from you, and given to a whole nation, the spiritual Israelites who accept Jesus Christ, the apostle, or Jesus himself. He is talking to the religious leaders, and he said, You think you are of Abraham. You think you're Jewish. I want to tell you, you don't belong to Abraham. You don't even know Abraham. You know who your father is? And then Romans 2.28, the Pharisee of the Pharisees himself, Paul, said, a Jew is not, has nothing to do with the outward distinctions, the nose, the hair, the circumcision, none of that. It's all inward. It's all in the heart. So who does this apply to? Who are the house of David and who are the inhabitants of Jerusalem? Who are they? They should be people that are sitting in pews in the Hollister Church today. We are those people. And what does God promise? And I will pour upon the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. You see, the focal point of the end time should not be a focus on the bloodshed going on out there or the bloodshed that occurs to us. God's focus is on an outpouring of His Spirit that results in an outpouring of grace and supplications. You know what an outpouring of grace is? 
I believe God wants his people to experience this. An outpouring of grace will mean that when, come, when it comes time to test, testify, to share how God has blessed you, you, you won't be able to contain yourself. You will often find yourself weeping at the goodness and the graciousness of God. Just yesterday I was seated right here on this pew wrestling with this passage and it just came to me how much grace God has extended to me just in this last week. My wife and I have gone through some things and God has showed up again and again and again just in the last week. That's him. Twenty years ago, I wouldn't have even appreciated that. But God is moving, will move his people so that they will be able to appreciate. You see, in both instances, when something is poured out, there is a human response that is required. Supplication, it's obvious. We're going to be on our knees in prayer. But grace, we will have another response. It will be to open our arms wide and say thank you. We serve a gracious, incredible God. I expect to see more and more God pouring out a, an outpouring of grace and prayer upon this church. God is going to move us to tears at His goodness and to our knees. And you know where all this intersects? It says there in verse 10, I will pour upon them the spirit of grace and supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Who's that? That's Jesus. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. The intersection of grace and supplication will occur at the cross. Because it's at the cross where I see my desperate need and His amazing grace. And because of His amazing grace and my desperate need, it drives me to my knees. Some of you know this because you've been driven to your knees. Somebody came into a church that I was pastoring a while back and they said, we've never seen so much praying going on before. Friends, that's where the power is at. When I became a pastor in this conference, we would go to workers' meetings and I would bring a briefcase with me with tax returns that needed to be filled out. And while they were giving dry statistical reports on the numbers of offerings and various policies that needed to be adhered to, I was thinking, line 10, subset A, is that the right dollar amount? And if it got particular, if I got done with that, I moved, I pulled out my laptop and I began writing letters. And then a new leader came into the conference and Suddenly, pastors were on their knees praying. That's what God wants. And that all takes place at the cross. It's interesting to me. It says they will look upon him who they have pierced. Look at Zechariah 12 through 14 again. All nations are gathered against Israel. That's the first tier of the chiasm on chapter 12 and chapter 14. And verse 12, chapter 12 and 14 tells us that God's people go through difficult times. In both chapters on either end, in both sidebars, 
God delivers His people. But if you exclusively look at the sidebars, you will miss the main point. The main point of this chiasm is not the persecution of God's people. It's not about my blood. It's about His blood that transforms me. It's about His blood that drives me to my knees in my need as I'm supplicating Him for what I need to go through this time. It is the transformation of God's people. The Bible says, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And as I look here and at the next verse we're going to look at, the only action that God's people have are, are really taking is looking. It says, and they shall look on, upon me. Do you see that in chapter 12, verse 10? I had to know what that means. It doesn't mean glance. It doesn't mean just a momentary, oh, I see who's playing the organ. It doesn't mean, oh, okay. It is a gaze. And the identical word takes place. Well, let me set the stage. You see, back when God's people came out of Egypt, they encamped at the base of Mount Sinai. And there at the base of Mount Sinai, God thunders His Ten Commandment law. Moses goes up into the mountain to communicate with God. He's there for 40 days. God's people get restless. They get anxious. And guess what they do? They build a what? They build a golden calf at the base of the mountain. Moses comes down and in horror shatters the Ten Commandments that have just been written. Moses moves quickly, 3,000 of the men who have been involved in the apostasy are lying dead in their own blood. It's a sobering time. You can imagine losing friends and husbands and fathers in this time. God's displeasure is keenly felt. God is threatening, saying, Moses, you lead this people. I'm not going to have anything to do with them. If you want to bring them into the promised land, go for it. The people of Israel are so sober and so Repentant that you know what they do? They remove all their jewelry. They come to Moses. And then comes this passage. And Moses took the tabernacle. The tent, the tabernacle, the sanctuary wasn't yet built yet. So this is a different one. He took the tabernacle, which he himself met in, a little tent. And instead of pitching it in the center of the tent, center of the camp, he pitches it without the camp, afar away, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone that sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of the congregation, which was outside the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out under the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door, so when Moses went out there, when he left the camp and walked out into the desert away that mile or so out to his own tent, what were God's people, what were the Israelites doing? What were they doing? Where, where were they? They were at their tent door. And what were they doing? In what posture were they? They were standing. And the Bible tells us that they stood every man at his tent door and they did what? They looked after Moses. Was that look just a glance? Same word right here. Oh, friends, their eyes followed him. And what was going on in their heart is their eyes following him. Deep contrition for their own sin. A sense of guilt. A sense of regret. That all goes into that phrase and look. And back in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it says, And you will look upon me whom you have pierced. Oh, friends, you and I will look at Jesus the same way. Deep regret, sorrow, a 
emotion. There will be a mourning for our own failures. I know there are some Christians that today are saying, you know, it's all about praise. And you know what? It is all about praise. We can praise the Lord. But you know what? What about this text? You will also find God's people, even though they're happy and joyful, they will, you will find them meditating, mourning, sorrowing over what Jesus went through because of their own sins. And you know what's going to happen in that day? Verse Chapter 13, verse 1. This is, again, a part of the apex of a chiasm. And in that day there shall be a what? A fountain open to the sin, to the house of David and to the inhabitants of the Jerusalem. Who, who are they? The house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, who are they? So who's the fountain open for? It's open for us. And when was, it, when was that fountain opened? It was opened 2,000 years ago when he died. A fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And guess what it says? There will be a fountain, and what will it be for? It'll be for what? Sin and uncleanness. And you know what? Some of us are struggling today. Some of us are struggling with idols. It may be with a substance. It may be with food. It may be with something like caffeine or nicotine or alcohol. We don't know. I don't know what you're struggling with. You may be struggling with some sort of an idol or an addiction to entertainment. Maybe something you watch on television. Maybe a show that you're watching that the Lord is saying, no, don't watch that anymore. That's an idol to you. You may be struggling with something you're seeing on the Internet. It may even be pornography. And you may be struggling and saying, Lord, I want to be cleansed from this. There is a fountain that's been opened just for you. And do you know how effective that fountain is? It will, it will come to pass in that day, verse 2, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land. Notice it doesn't say that I will get rid of the idols. But I will cut off the names of the idols and they shall be no more what? Remembered. God is going to bring you and I if we are accepting of the spirit of grace and supplication that's being poured out on us. If we accept it, if we receive it, God will bring each of us to a place where the idols that have been in our lives will no longer be there. And not only will they not be there, but they will no longer be remembered. It says, in that day there shall be a fountain opened. In the Middle East, there were three kinds of water supplies. There were cisterns. You know, you know what a cistern was? It was a big hole in the ground and they had drainage ditches running into it and when it rained, all the cistern filled up and if a dead rat happened to get in there, so what? You know, leaves, whatever. That was your drinking supply. Water was that precious. But even better than that was a well and God's people dug wells. Isaac, Abraham, both dug wells. Good things. But oh, then there was the ladder. A fountain, something bursting up out of the out of the ground, and oh, when you could find one of those, you were rolling in it. It was good stuff. How many of you have ever seen artesian wells? Any of you? I have. Our neighbors were digging a well, and they reached 260 feet, and all of a sudden, a piece of pipe comes hurling up out of the. Uh, I think that's what happened out of the uh, well, and. Uh, and the water is still flowing to this day. This, according to some, when it was discovered back in 1922, is an artesian well that 
gave out 3,500 gallons per minute, is still giving 500 gallons per minute, still flowing. But, oh, friends, this is nothing compared to the fountain that's been open for us. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. They don't just lose their guilty stains, they lose their guilty chains. They are free, washed. And I want you to think about this. Because in a few moments we're going to move into a time where we celebrate the blood of Jesus that was shed on our behalf. I love this song. At, upon the cross of Jesus, my eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears to wonders I confess, the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. God is pouring out a spirit of grace and supplication and He wants us to be aware of it. But you know, a number of us are perhaps like that prisoner not too long ago. One of my professors in college told this story in the Signs of the Times. He said that prison commissioners went to the governor and asked that five prisoners be pardoned from the Ohio State Penitentiary. The governor granted them. The prisoners were all gathered into the chapel in the center of the prison. And the chairman stood up and said, I hold in my hands pardons for five men. You could have heard a pin drop. The suspense was awful. Guys are turning pale. It's as if their hearts are stopping beating. Finally, he gets around to announcing the first name. Reuben Johnson, will you come and get your pardon? He holds it out. Nobody moves. Reuben Johnson, get your pardon. Nobody moves. He turns to the warden. He says, are all the prisoners here? Yes, they're here. Will Reuben Johnson please come and get his pardon? It is signed by the governor. He is a free man. Finally, the chaplain looked down the road to where he saw Reuben sitting, and he caught his eye, and he said, Reuben, that's you. Reuben is, you know what Reuben's doing. He's looking around, trying to see who's getting the pardon. Finally, the, the chaplain says, no, Reuben, it's you, it's you. And a confused look on his face, he slowly gets to his feet, and trembling, he walks to the front, he receives the pardon, and he walks back to his chair where he buries his head in his hands and he weeps. And afterwards, when it's time for the men to form ranks and march back to their cells, you know who's with them? Yeah, you guessed it. Reuben's there. And the chaplain has to call out again and says, Reuben, get out of the ranks. You're a free man. Meditate on these things. We celebrate an open communion. But we do it a little differently than some. We have a foot washing service like Jesus and his disciples had before they received, they shared the Passover emblems. And the, that foot washing service will take place. The Bible tells us that Paul writes, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. 
and he broke it when he had given thanks and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And I'd like to ask that you would bow your heads with us as one of our elders, um, Bob Kennedy has a special blessing on this symbol of Christ's body. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what Jesus has done for us in giving totally of himself. And this bread symbolizes what Jesus has done for us. Forgive us for what our shortcomings. And we thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done and continue to do in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible also says that that same na night after he took the cup when he had supped, he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, I'm going to ask that you bow your heads for prayer as our head elder, um, Dr. Clark, has a special prayer of blessing for the symbol of Christ's blood. Our Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We especially thank you that he spilled his blood for us. Blood is a symbol of life, and as we take this pure grape juice into our bodies, may we accept Christ into our lives and live for him. In Jesus' name, amen. These are just symbols, but what precious symbols of the life of Jesus and the grace that forever fountain that blesses us with life. Take, eat. Drink you all of it. I 
I really believe that Jesus' presence is here at seasons like this in particular. I'm praising him for that. Thank you so much for your testimonies of faith and joy and his mercy. Beautiful. Before we, uh, as, as we leave today, I, we normally take up an offering for those among us that have needs. So I'd like to have deacons or ushers, ushers available at the door to receive those as you leave on your way out. Also, the Bible record is that they sang a hymn and they went out. <laughs>